Uh, comment. I am Jonathan Anton. I am the other academic dean. Um, I've been in office for all of two weeks, uh, and so I simply defer to Mel uh, for, for most things. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce our keynote speaker this afternoon. Uh, if you'll indulge me for a second, uh, I tell my, my first year students especially uh, that when I was in practice, um, I was part of a team that helped to exonerate a fellow who came within about 12 hours of being executed uh, for a horrendous crime uh, in Florida for which he had absolutely no, or with which he had absolutely no involvement. Um, that's a pretty sobering experience. Uh, uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Barry Sheck, has been involved in a lot more than one of these. Uh, uh, he and the Innocence Project have been uh, involved uh, with uh, uh, most of the whatever the number is now that, we've, that has been bandied about. There, there's 183 in one place and 189 in another, and this morning I think the figure is 194. Whatever it is, it's a lot of exonerations. Um, uh, Barashek has been at the uh, Cardozo Law School in New York for nearly 30 years. Uh, he is, as I mentioned, one of the, uh, one of the directors of, of the Innocence Project. Uh, and rather than take up lots of time repeating things that are in the program, let me just turn things over to you. It's a real honor to have you here. Thank you so very much, Dean. And uh, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here because uh, uh, so many of uh, my heroes and colleagues are in the room, um, and uh, uh, particularly Paul Gianelli, who uh, uh, in terms of all this forensic evidence uh, has been uh, our great teacher for so many years. Uh, we decided to come to town. That's Colin Starger, who's one of our staff attorneys at the Innocence Project. Um, we figured we might as well bring a case. Uh, but it really did happen quite coincidentally. Uh, uh, those of you involved in the planning of the program know that Peter Neufeld had accepted your invitation uh, uh, to give this talk. And then uh, what happened is that the National Research Council, the National Academy of Sciences, uh, uh, received a grant of $1.5 million to uh, start conducting uh, a, a commission report on identifying issues in forensic science, uh, which is something that's uh, very much needed. And uh, so he uh, was asked to give a presentation today in Washington, D.C. As a matter of fact, Paul is on that committee, but he's, he stayed true to the invitation. Um, and so when we uh, realized that we had this conflict, um, you know, I agreed to come and give a talk on uh, uh, Brady material and exculpatory evidence, and I'm actually going to get to uh, what the plan was, the, uh, the, the sort of uh, interesting intellectual issue um, <clears throat> that I wanted to address with you. Uh, but in, at the same time, it turned out, um, we at the Innocence Project uh, received a report of DNA test results in a case that uh, Colin Starger, um, along with uh, Terry Gilbert, who just left here, uh, uh, a lawyer here in Cleveland you all know very well, um, had been working on uh, uh, involving uh, two uh, individuals, Tom Siller um, and uh, Wally Zimmer. And I will discuss that case briefly with you because that one, too, actually raises issues that are directly on point uh, for purposes of this conference. Uh, but let me start where uh, we really all should start uh, at the Innocence Project, and that's with uh, our clients in the cases because uh, really – uh, we've been very privileged uh, to be involved in all this post-conviction DNA testing, and uh, it, I think, is a learning moment for the criminal justice system that really is going to help uh, prosecutors and defense and judges and police uh, learn a lot about how to protect the innocent but also how to identify the guilty um, and to enhance the reliability of the system as a whole, and that's what this all should be about. And when we talk about issues of prosecutorial misconduct and suppressed Brady material, you know, we really shouldn't forget that. Uh, it really, every time the innocent person um, is arrested, convicted, uh, sentenced to prison, or God forbid, executed, the real perpetrator uh, is out there free to commit more crimes. Uh, so if we can get a handle on what's wrong with our system um, and fix it, uh, it's really a win-win for everybody. So these DNA exonerations have really given us that opportunity, and we are indeed 
uh, up to 194 post-conviction DNA exonerations. And, and if you're saying, well, why are there, aren't there seem to be more of them? Uh, the answer is, uh, yeah, the pace of these are picking up, but the cases are old. Um, and the truth is, is that uh, when Peter Neufeld and I got involved in this is really a, a supplement to a clinical program at Cardozo Law School way back in 1992. Um, you know, we didn't raise a lot of money. We really didn't have too many people working with us. And now we have this independent nonprofit entity and we have like uh, something like 30 employees and we have brilliant people like Colin, um, the four staff attorneys uh, that can do all the work. Um, we have a huge intake department that goes through these cases. Um, and of course, uh, what's been wonderful is that projects have begun to form all across the country. And so um, uh, at the University of Cincinnati Law School, there's an Ohio Innocence Project. Um, and uh, uh, Jenny Carroll was just here, one of the, the staff attorney just hired at that project. And uh, oh, it's, uh, the director there is Mark Gotze, and they've been able to do some wonderful things as well. Uh, and in fact, I should correct right away, there's in the story in the Cleveland Plain Dealer today, they talked about the exonerations here in the state of Ohio. And we did work on the Brian Pizak case and the Michael Green case, uh, but the <clears throat> uh, two others that they mentioned, uh, the Elkins case and the Bennett case, were really uh, Ohio Innocence Project cases, uh, the real good ones. So right now, there are 194 post-conviction DNA exonerations. So let me clear what these are. Um, these are cases where people were convicted, they lost their appeals in most of these instances, they lost their post-conviction motions, um, <clears throat> and uh, state or federal habeas, and then uh, really, uh, years later, uh, a DNA test on a material piece of crime scene evidence vacates the conviction, and they, uh, the charges are dismissed. In one instance, uh, they were retried and acquitted. That was the case of Rolando Cruz in, uh, uh, in Illinois, and uh, uh, the fact is, is that the prosecutors who brought the new prosecution were themselves indicted for obstruction of justice for even retrying him and doing the whole case, uh, although they, in fairness, were acquitted as well. Um, and so what I'm trying to say is that we're pretty careful. Not every DNA case uh, will make it onto our list. We try to make this list bulletproof. Um, so there are only, and uh, in, I think close to 70% of these cases, there's either been an acknowledgement from, uh, formally by the prosecutor, a gubernatorial pardon on the grounds of innocence, or some kind of uh, uh, compensation, uh, either pursuant to state statute or a lawsuit. Uh, so we're looking at, at a group of cases where these people are innocent. Now, there is a list from the Death Penalty Information Center having to do with, I think it's something like... Uh, 122, don't uh, uh, ask me about the number now, of individuals who were charged uh, with, uh, the who were convicted and sentenced to death in this country since the reinstitution of the death penalty, whose convictions were vacated based on some new evidence of innocence, and they neither acquitted or their charges dismissed. Um, <clears throat> those numbers are in somewhat greater, are in greater dispute. Um, uh, Josh Marquis from the National District Attorneys Association, Paul Casale, a, uh, a very smart federal judge now in uh, Utah, and others have attacked some of those, and they're saying, well, it's not 122, it's 80, it's 40, whatever the number is. Um, uh, Scalia, of course, mentioned some of this in his recent dissent in uh, Kansas versus Marsh uh, on, frankly, an unrelated issue. Um, so you'll see that controversy. But even when you look at that controversy, you'll see uh, that uh, uh, Paul Casal, certainly, who helped us found an innocence project in Utah, um, and uh, uh, even uh, uh, Josh Marquis and others, nobody's disputing these DNA numbers. Um, 14 of them, more people sentenced to death. They average about 11.5 years in jail. Um, in more than 25% of the cases, the real assailant has been identified um, uh, ordinarily with DNA testing. Um, and uh, it, it, in at least uh, as many as 40% of the cases, maybe it's a little less now, um, we finally get the transcripts and the evidence, and we see that DNA would make a difference in the outcome. It would be outcome determinative, but we, the evidence is lost or destroyed. Uh, but to really keep a, a, a focus on this, I think the number that really is changing the system and has some resonance is the fact that uh, since 
Uh, the FBI uh, and others started doing DNA testing in 1989. There have been tens of thousands of people who have been arrested or indicted, and then before conviction, the DNA has exonerated them. And I think that that really is what's changing attitudes uh, about the system. Unfortunately, we don't keep careful track of these things. Um, and uh, there's a very smart uh, risk management guy at uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Baruch Weizkos, and he once, uh, uh, in considering this problem, pointed out that if you really want to change an institution, you have to change its paperwork. It's really true. And what we really should be doing, whether it's through DNA or other forms of proof, um, uh, and if you're looking at the issue of suppressed Brady material and misconduct um, or ineffective assistance of counsel, frankly, unless you formally and in a systematic way do an official count and keep track of these things, you're never going to get a handle on the dimensions of the problem or what we can do about it. And that is certainly something that is not systematically collected and should be. Um, okay. Um, the, uh, you might be familiar with uh, a recent article in Science by uh, Kohler and Sachs about forensic science and the paradigm shift where they did look at our cases, um, the first 86. Um, so it's not just us making these uh, uh, assessments. Uh, but eyewitness error contributed, and these are the DNA exonerations, in 71 percent of the cases, forensic test error in 53 percent, police misconduct, prosecutorial misconduct, you see the percentages there, um, forensic fraud, uh, you see the percentage, uh, dishonest informants, uh, which could be a jailhouse snitch, um, uh, incompetent defense, 19 percent, that, that is a, a totally understated figure. Um, but we don't have any good real way of assessing that. Uh, uh, there's far more uh, bad defense than uh, people think and witness perjury. So those are some of the numbers. Now, what I really came to talk to you about today, or at least what Colin and I had thought about as a presentation, is a very interesting issue um, having to do with how you evaluate uh, subject matter of this conference is Brady material, but new evidence uh, showing that there was a false testimony or false facts presented in front of a jury. Um, as you all know, uh, in the, uh, uh, virtually every state in this country, the standard for assessing uh, whether or not newly discovered evidence of innocence uh, should, uh, has reached a threshold where a conviction should be vacated, uh, the test is a reasonable probability of a different outcome. And so what judges are supposed to do is look at the record evidence in the case, consider the newly discovered evidence, and as we all know, that has to be evidence that you couldn't find with uh, uh, due diligence, right, in the first place, so some cases fall out. It's not just all evidence of innocence. But you look at the newly discovered evidence of innocence, you compare it to the record, and you ask the question, uh, <clears throat> Is there a reasonable probability that uh, the defendant wouldn't have been convicted or convicted of a lesser charge? That's the standard. And as we all also know, uh, in looking at these cases, over the years, certain kinds of evidence um, have been valued as not so persuasive in the newly discovered evidence of innocence context. And that is uh, uh, recantations. How many cases have you read, it's true in virtually every jurisdiction, that a, quote, mere recantation is not enough to vacate a conviction uh, or to make out a reasonable probability of a different outcome? And the reason for that rule, frankly, is quite sensible, uh, because even if a witness is uh, recanting the, uh, his or her testimony about a very material fact in a case, or is the star witness in the case, uh, the danger, of course, is that that person lied once under oath uh, or misstated something once under oath could flip back again. And after all, if we vacate a conviction and then retry the case 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, uh, it's much harder to gather all the evidence together. And what guarantee would we have that the next fact finding would be more reliable than the first? This is the argument uh, that Justice Rehnquist uh, makes um, in Herrera. Um, which I always thought was a, a, a very good and powerful one. Um, so there's good reason that recantations are disfavored when courts are deciding whether or not to vacate convictions. Um, and of course, we all know that in the area of Brady material, 
uh, the, you know, the court has now come up with a standard that um, if you know that there's suppressed evidence, even if the prosecutor uh, did not know uh, that the evidence, the exculpatory evidence was suppressed, but some police agent did it, uh, the standard is a reasonable possibility that confidence in the verdict would be undermined. Now, obviously, that's a lower standard, a somewhat uh, more subjective standard, if you think about it, and it reflects the view of the courts that if there is misconduct in a case, and suppressed Brady material is misconduct, then the standard for reversal should be lower. And one of the reasons the standard for reversal should be lower is that the public will not have confidence in its tribunals. After all, there was some kind of misconduct that brought about the conviction in the first place that the Brady evidence was suppressed, and that's why the standard is lower. And of course, uh, the uh, lowest standard of all is uh, when you have a situation where perjured testimony, false testimony is brought before the tribunal uh, and is used as the basis for the conviction, then the burden shifts completely and the prosecution has to show uh, that but for that uh, false or perjured testimony, uh, you know, the conviction should stand that the perjured testimony uh, or false testimony was harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and so the standard goes. And what we have found at the Innocence Project, after all, we're using post-conviction DNA evidence in case after case, looking at blood stains, semen stains, saliva stains, all forms of biological evidence, and we're now in a situation where we come back and we're saying, wait a second, here is let's say a serologist who performs a completely competent job on saliva or blood or semen uh, but was using uh, uh, ABO testing, conventional uh, genetic markers that weren't very discriminating in the old days or uh, even early forms of DNA testing that may not have been that discriminating and we have new forms of testing that, is more, that are more discriminating. Let's say we have that kind of situation and the jury is led to believe that an important piece of evidence in the case uh, you know, shows that uh, uh, it uh, could have been the defendant who was the source of blood uh, at a crime scene or that blood from some victim is, on the, uh, is or is not on the defendant or something like that. Um, that is, even though the analyst, assuming complete good faith, did nothing wrong, that is still a false fact that was presented to the jury. And it doesn't have to be DNA testing. It could be a reevaluation, as we can do these days, of fingerprints. It could be, and Paul Gianelli has led the way with that National Research Council panel, um, we now know that there's uh, you know, more than three decades worth of cases where comparative uh, lead bullet analysis was done and people from the FBI in complete good faith would get on the witness stand and they'd say, this deformed bullet that we found at the crime scene um, comes from this little box of bullets that the defendant had, or it doesn't, um, and uh, was manufactured within a certain period of time, et cetera. And we now know that that turns out to be a completely unreliable analysis and can't be used for any purposes in a court. That's 30 years' worth of evidence. So there's been a number of areas um, where the forensic science has been invalidated, and now we all of a sudden have a false fact that was given to the jury. Now, let's just assume that it was done in complete good faith, right? It is not deliberate perjury, therefore, but it is nonetheless a false fact. That, I would argue, and we have argued, <laughs> Colin and I in some courts these days, ought to be weighed more heavily when you're considering whether or not there's a reasonable probability of a different outcome, just as recantations are not favored for good reasons when you have a false, an objectively false fact, particularly if it arises out of scientific evidence, that is something that would have had greater impact on the jury. It affects all the other testimony. It should be viewed cumulatively. We know that from Kyles v. Whitley and the Banks case uh, and all the learning in the area of uh, suppressed exculpatory evidence. You have to accumulate it, see what would have been done with it at the time of trial and how it affects assessments of other forms of evidence. Um, so the false fact seems to me worthy of special weight. And I would commend your attention uh, to two documents, and of course we will for the case Western Law Review, write about this. 
um, but uh, as part of this uh, wonderful forum you're putting together here. Uh, but we submitted a brief in the House case, which of course comes from the Sixth Circuit, and you had that uh, terrible dilemma that you had eight judges on the Sixth Circuit that said, uh, we don't think that there's enough new evidence in this case, including a DNA test, um, uh, that uh, Mr. House, who was sentenced to death in uh, Tennessee, um, uh, we don't think that there's enough evidence to meet the Schlupp v. Delos standard, that is, uh, to allow Mr. Uh, House's a uh, uh, habeas corpus position, which was a successor writ, be heard on the issue of suppressed Brady material and ineffective assistance of counsel. Uh, eight judges of the Sixth Circuit said, we don't think there's enough evidence to show that but for the new evidence, it was more probable than not that there would have been a different outcome in the case. And six judges uh, of the Sixth Circuit said, what are you talking about looking at this new evidence? We think he's actually innocent and his whole conviction should be thrown out with no retrial. And one judge said, well, he may or may not be actually innocent, but there's certainly enough to reach his underlying constitutional claims. And in our brief in House, we make the argument because uh, part of the presentation there was that there was semen, right, found in the victim, uh, which was uh, considered uh, by serological testing consistent with House. In fact, it came from the victim's husband, and it was the theory of defense in that case that the husband, in fact, who had a history of violence and had confessed to two other people that he had, in fact, committed the murder was the perpetrator. So that the objective fact that the semen was the husband's and was not from House is a false fact that we argued uh, is the kind of situation where the greater weight ought to be given to it by the courts and explicitly. We made a similar argument that I think was accepted uh, uh, in the reasoning of a case called Ralph Armstrong by the Wisconsin Supreme Court, which was a case that was vacated with uh, uh, new DNA evidence uh, uh, on hairs, um, uh, essentially, um, in, in that case. So, and, and the reason that I think that the false fact should be weighted more greatly uh, is, well, obviously, uh, you know, it's, it is false. In, I mean, it is very close to perjured testimony in a certain sense. I mean, it is that false. It's objectively false. Um, and secondly, um, if you think about the notion about what undermines confidence in a tribunal, um, I think in this day and age, certainly, uh, that when people, uh, the public sees that you can be convicted in a case where the facts, the scientific facts put before the jury are false, but the courts say, oh, that's okay, we're going to let that conviction stand. Uh, that's something that I think does undermine confidence uh, in the court system. And so while it is not technically Brady material in the sense that it was um, conscious and knowing misconduct on the part of the state, it seems to me that it begins to fall between these standards, yes, um, uh, when you're trying to consider a reasonable probability of a different outcome, it's not quite Brady material in the technical sense, but it should be weighed more heavily, is really the argument we're making to you. Um, and this, of course, uh, uh, leads me to uh, the, what was one of the issues uh, that brought us here to uh, Cleveland today. Um, and that is uh, the case that you read about in today's Cleveland Plain Dealer involves uh, two individuals, um, Siller and Zimmer. And uh, they were convicted first of attempted murder um, <clears throat> of a woman who was in a home here in Cleveland, somebody they knew, somebody that they had uh, done work for. Both of them had uh, uh, narcotics problems. They were friends with uh, this woman who was a victim. Uh, they did work for her in her home, and uh, they owed her money. The, none of that is in dispute. Um, and uh, she was uh, literally found uh, one evening. Uh, there had been a break-in in the back door of the house, uh, splintered area, the place had been ransacked, uh, she was tied to a chair, uh, she had been beaten uh, badly uh, about the face. Uh, she is literally in this chair in a room and there's spatter on the wall behind her and some blood in front of her uh, on the chair. And actually, as the evidence came out, um, uh, Mr. Zimmer had been walking past the house, had seen the light on, knew uh, that his uh, friend, the deceased in this case, who ordinarily wouldn't be up that late, looks in the door, uh, goes into the apartment, sees her there, 
<clears throat> he panics. He calls his girlfriend, um, says, what should I do? I have some warrants. You know, uh, uh, I, I know her. What should we do? She, the girlfriend herself, uh, uh, by her own admission, was uh, high on drugs. They call Mr. Siller, uh, who is their friend, and Mr. Siller immediately says, well, you've got to notify the police. You should have done that right away. And so uh, Zimmer goes to a public phone, calls 911, and describes that uh, uh, the victim is in the house. <clears throat> the police come, they do a crime scene. When they do a crime scene, they find fingerprints in a probative place. They run them through the APHIS system, and they get a hit on this fellow, Jay Smith. Uh, Jay Smith is a, uh, a local drug dealer. He has a criminal history which involves violence, um, and uh, he is eventually brought down and questioned by the police. Um, and here's where the story gets very strange, but uh, it appears that uh, you just had a talk by Paul on jailhouse snitches. There appear to be a lot of them here in Cleveland somehow, <laughs> and they're all over this case. Um, so uh, Smith is put into a jail cell, and uh, there's another guy there, and Smith begins to confide to him. He says, well, you know, uh, they arrested me on this case, and I actually did it. Um, and I, I did it alone. I don't have any Confederates to give him, but uh, uh, I'm going to give him an alibi that I was in Louisville, which is false, right? And uh, then this person to whom he confides this information goes to the authorities and says, hey, Smith you know, did this crime. It's his fingerprints. He thinks he got rid of the clothes, right, um, uh, the bloody clothes, uh, but uh, he's uh, going to give you a false alibi about being in Louisville. So the police start questioning Smith, and he says, I had nothing to do with this case or anything like that. I was in Louisville. <laughs> he actually says what the snitch is going to say. Um, and uh, eventually he's charged with the murder. Uh, and they do go to his girlfriend's home um, looking for the clothes 10 days later, um, and they do actually secure a pair of pants uh, that it's believed he could have been wearing at or around the time of this incident. Um, and the pants have a blood stain on it, and Siller, uh, Smith himself has, uh, as part of his original false story, uh, admitted that uh, you know, he had been bleeding and there was an injury to his knee, and it's clear on these pants that there's a huge big blood stain um, uh, in that area. Um, so uh, he is uh, uh, questioned by the police, but of course they have interest in Siller and Zimmer, uh, who themselves came forward along with uh, uh, Zimmer's girlfriend and told their story about how the body was discovered and talked to the authorities without counsel um, and gave statements. And it's frankly been their position uh, from the, the time that uh, they originally came forward to the authorities till today uh, that what I've told you essentially is what happened. Um, so what occurs next is that uh, over time Smith uh, uh, negotiates a deal with the prosecutors um, and uh, he persuades them that he did not do this crime alone, he did it with Zimmer and Siller um, and that uh, he came into this house and uh, he was uh, look as, as taking material from it as he looked in these rooms and in one of the rooms uh, it was uh, Zimmer and uh, Siller, but particularly Zimmer, uh, who was beating up the victim. And as soon as he saw that uh, Zimmer was beating up the victim, he immediately turned and ran away. That was his story. Um, and uh, he got a deal uh, from the prosecutors. Uh, he got three years for his involvement in this murder. Uh, he got immunity from any possible capital prosecution because the victim uh, lived for two years, okay, and this was in the first time when they were being tried for attempted murder. Uh, and, uh, but if everybody was anticipating that she might die of her injuries, in which case it could become a capital prosecution. So he got three years, he got immunity from any possible capital prosecution, he got a deal on another felony case, um, and uh, during the same period of time he started wearing a wire in jail, he testified against a male nurse from with whom he had uh, sexual intercourse, he had a very interesting history um, as a snitch witness prior to this trial and then subsequently. Um, and so Smith, uh, who's quite a charismatic figure, testifies at this first trial. And here's where things get interesting. Uh, because uh, a key part of the case, of course, is that he is in another room. He's not around when the violence happens or any blood is going to be you know, spattered anywhere. And um, he runs away. 
and the prosecution puts, on, puts into evidence testimony from one Joseph Sirwak. And Joseph Sirwak was a criminalist here in Cleveland. Uh, he did hair and serology work, and he uh, apparently uh, was uh, tasked to examine the pants of uh, Mr. Smith uh, in order for the prosecution to prove that there was no blood spatter on the pants of Mr. Smith that came back to the victim. And therefore, he was not there when anything happened. It was Zimmer who did the, the beating. And that was Smith's story. Um, and uh, uh, during cross-examination at this first trial, where uh, Siller and Zimmer were tried for attempted murder, uh, Surik was questioned very closely by defense counsel because it turned out that he didn't have any good underlying data that shows that he really did any presumptive testing on these stains uh, on the pants. And he was saying things like, well, uh, the, if, uh, I, if there's a stain there, and they don't look like blood stains to me because of their color, um, but uh, if, if they were positive, you know, if there was any blood there and it presumptively tested positive, I would have done it. Um, and then he sort of admits, well, he assumes he must have done it. And so his testimony goes. Um, then uh, the Siller and Zimmer are convicted of attempted murder. The victim dies. Um, and then there's a subsequent trial where uh, the death penalty is put on the table and Siller is tried first, uh, facing death. And at this trial, uh, the prosecution opens and they talk about how there's no blood on the pants of Smith other than his own blood, nothing from the victim. It's a key part of their case. And the cross-examination then ensues, a very good job by the defense lawyer, tearing into Sirwak and his lack of documentation and how do we know that, uh, you, you know, these stains really aren't blood and things of that nature. Um, and then uh, eventually a juror asks a question. I was really amazed to see that. I guess you have juror questions here. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, literally starts asking questions about the stain, and so Sirwak goes back and he looks at everything again, right? And he looks at the pants again, and this time he finds on the back of the pants, okay, on the back of the pants, excuse my, uh, uh, let's see if I've got this. All right, now, can you see this diagram, okay? Uh, now, these are red and blue dots that uh, we put on the pants uh, at the, to represent the places where you could see things. But do you see the blue dot on the uh, diagram that says back of the pants? So there was, uh, Sirwa comes back at the second trial and he says there's this small little microscopic blood stain that I have now found on the back of Smith's pants. Um, and they then, it, it is in fact blood, they do a DNA test on it, and it does come back to the victim. Okay? Uh, the prosecutor in closing argument says, you know, gee, if I had known about that blood, that little microscopic blood stain, I might not have offered him a three-year deal. Uh, what must have happened is that as the beating started in the next room, he uh, was, you know, a number of feet away, he must have turned, and the you know, the blood just hit him there or he might have brushed up against something, but that's how that one little blood stain got there. And then the prosecutor tells the jury in closing argument, it would be a different story if the blood spatter were on the front of the pants. Okay? Now, Sirwak himself, at the time of this trial when he's cross-examined, goes back and forth, back and forth, and finally it is nailed down. He says, yes, I looked at these pants. I looked at every stain on these pants. I tested every stain on these pants to see if there was blood. Every single one of them, he's clear. That's his clear statement and testimony. <clears throat> well, um, uh, there's a conviction. Uh, thankfully, the jury uh, did not come back with a death verdict against Siller. He was sentenced to, what, 30 years to life. Um, and then, time out. Another set of events here in the city of Cleveland. Um, there is a man named Michael Green, who many of you might have seen here earlier uh, this afternoon. Uh, and Anthony Michael Green was convicted of sexual assault uh, down the block, really, at the Cleveland Clinic Hospital. Um, <clears throat> and to make a very long story short, um, it, part of the basis for his conviction was the testimony of Joseph Sirwick, a criminalist. And Mr. Sirwick originally got a pubic hair in that case. Uh, that came from a rape kit done on the victim, and he compared it to Michael Green's pubic hairs and realized it was not a match. 
and then went on for some reason to test the head hair against the pubic hair, and he said those were consistent with each other, and then he stated a statistic of something like, and the frequency of having that kind of a, a match or same characteristics is one in 43,000. Uh, then he stated some fre frequencies about uh, uh, ABO analysis of semen that included Mr. Green that were uh, technically not correct. Um, and uh, DNA testing was done uh, years later uh, in Mr. Green's case, uh, who always insisted on his innocence, who was not paroled because he insisted upon his innocence. Um, uh, the DNA testing on the semen came back uh, and excluded him. Uh, and uh, the district attorney's office agreed to vacate his conviction. It didn't happen right away, but it did happen. Um, and then uh, a year later, Connie Schultz wrote an article called The Burden of Innocence that appeared on the front page of the Cleveland Plain Dealer talking about how hard it had been for Michael in his one year uh, since he had left prison. And uh, the real perpetrator read this article and came forward and confessed to the crime. Michael Green came forward at the sentencing of that individual and asked that he get the minimum because he had come forward and for religious reasons and Michael was so grateful, at least the real perpetrator had come forward. <clears throat> uh, then Michael filed a civil suit um, and part of that civil suit was against the city of Cleveland for the work of Sirwick. And during discovery uh, in that case, uh, there were at least two instances where we asked for the underlying materials in this case and we found some cases where he was doing hair comparisons and uh, his raw notes indicated that the hairs didn't match but he reported that they were consistent. Um, the uh, city attorney's office uh, agreed uh, to settle this matter because they were thought, realized there was a serious problem with the work of Mr. Sirowak and he had been by that time uh, at the lab for 16 years. Um, the, uh, as part of this settlement as well, Michael Green uh, uh, agreed to forego, I think we estimated it's something close to $500,000 of damages that he would have otherwise received from the city, uh, on the agreement that an audit be conducted of Sirwick's work. And uh, uh, so that uh, it was agreed uh, that uh, one of my uh, friends and uh, heroes uh, is here today, Jim Woolley, uh, who is a former assistant United States attorney here in the city of Cleveland, and uh, litigated a number <clears throat> of landmark cases involving DNA evidence uh, against Peter Neufeld and I and won them <laughs> um, in gargantuan hearings that took forever. Uh, but actually, uh, uh, much of the science that came out of these hearings was then ultimately adopted by um, <clears throat> the National Academy of Science, or NRC, report called DNA and uh, Technology and Forensic Science. And uh, much of the work we did in that case and the war of the experts actually came to very good end because uh, uh, different standards were put in place for the molecular biology and the population genetics um, and I think it helped a great deal in terms of uh, the transfer of technology from uh, uh, DNA and medical genetics to the forensic arena to make it um, <clears throat> by no means perfect, you know, uh, nothing is perfect. Uh, uh, labs can always make mistakes, the best labs, even with the best technology, but DNA really has been transformative. Uh, and so uh, uh, Mr. Woolley was kind enough to agree to uh, do this audit and hired a criminalist named Robert Spaulding. Uh, to work on these matters. And they just went through the paperwork of Sirowick cases and they identified this one. Um, and the reason that this case was identified is that, as you can tell from my recitation, Sirowick's underlying data with respect to the testing of the pants did not indicate that he had done certain tests that obviously he was representing in the court that he had done. And so the conclusion of this paper audit and the terms and conditions of the audit were just to go through the science, just to go through the laboratory work and identify cases that were problematic. It was not to go any further to do DNA testing, to make any judgments about uh, convictions and well, you know, the significance of any of it. It was just as a matter of science to go through and identify cases uh, that should be examined further. And because this case was identified and we get so many requests at the Innocence Project that uh, we realize, oh my God, this is a, a, a Sirwick audit case. Has anybody written to us named Siller or uh, Zimmer? And indeed, we found out that Mr. Siller had submitted a letter. So this case was put to the front of the line. 
and DNA testing was in fact conducted, and the results came in, what, two weeks ago? Yeah, two weeks ago. And uh, what that report shows is that indeed the stains that uh, were on the pants, everybody agrees with stains on the pants, um, when tested, DNA showed came from the victim. And in this diagram, if you look, you see, uh, and we've placed it, red spots. Now, obviously, the stains are not as big as those red spots, but we're just trying to identify them for you uh, where they are. But you'll see that there are five stains on the front of the pants and two additional stains on the back of the pants, and all that is blood spatter uh, from the victim in this case. Um, and uh, so for purposes of this conference, um, what is that? Uh, there happens to be a, uh, an Ohio case that's directly on point that says if a police actor or agent gives perjured testimony, then the standard that uh, should be employed in deciding whether or not uh, to vacate the conviction is one that uh, uh, of harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. And so we have filed papers today um, uh, with the court it's one of those filings where you had to file. Um, there are two convictions for attempted murder and one for homicide in front of two different judges for two defendants. So there was a big filing this morning <laughs> in the court downtown, a lot of paper. Um, but we had given drafts of this to the district attorney's office as we were turning them out uh, in the hopes that they would uh, um, give this some serious thought because uh, regardless of whether they think Jay Smith is a truthful witness, because it is only Smith's testimony that uh, <clears throat> uh, provides any direct evidence. Without him, there's no case. Uh, that's clear enough. Um, against uh, Siller and Zimmer, regardless of whether they think these people are guilty or not, um, it seems to us, at least, that Sirwick's testimony <clears throat> is plainly false. And uh, it's very odd because uh, we can introduce the Michael Green case and the other cases as like 404B material. Uh, there's an absence of mistake here. It's not like he hasn't done this before. Um, and even if it's, you know, they're not, you know, it always reminds me of, you know, um, well, I won't say that. Uh, but it appears as though, you know, in embarrassing situations, this is a witness who just keeps on saying, well, I must have done that test, or I did do that test. Okay, I did do that test, which is literally how the testimony goes, even though there's no paperwork supporting that he did the test, and now we know there's blood stains that come back to the victim, so if he really did the test, he would have identified it, because these presumptive tests, as he testified at the trial, are extremely sensitive. The very tip of a paper mate pen, I think he said, you can these presumptive tests, you would be able to identify if there was blood there or not. And certainly if he had really tested those stains, um, he would have gotten the results that uh, Dr. Blake did from Forensic Science Associates or we would have had DNA testing. So that's the case that I came here with you uh, to consider in Cleveland. Um, it actually, I think, is quite important uh, for another reason. And that is um, we have had in this country um, an epidemic of crime lab scandals. Um, and they have led to, um, in, in a number of different areas. I mean, I think that, the, as I indicated, there's uh, the report that Paul Gianelli did on weighing bullet lead evidence. Uh, there's problems in arson cases, bite marks, things of that nature. And there have been an epidemic of uh, uh, laboratory scandals. Um, there was this fellow, Fred Zane, in uh, West Virginia. We have Sirwak here in Cleveland, a fellow named Arnold Melnikoff in Montana. Uh, in Houston, crime lab, they're literally uh, Mike Bromwich, former um, uh, inspector general in the Clinton administration, did a fantastic audit of the Houston crime lab, and that was um, unbelievable. Uh, uh, Pam Fish in Illinois, there's been quite a number of these cases. So you're getting a lot of these cases where there are false facts, and some of these people were just uh, the evidence is that they were frauds. Um, but what eventually happened is that, uh, that's Mike Bromwich there, eventually we're having some, the, the, uh, in 2004, uh, the Justice for All Act was passed, and Section 311 of the Justice for All Act um, says that every crime lab in the United States that wants to get money uh, pursuant to the Paul Coverdale Laboratory Improvement Act must certify in their applications that there is an independent entity in their state that can audit 
right, that there's an independent entity and a process in place to conduct an audit of any serious negligence or misconduct in a crime lab. And if you can't so certify, and there is no such process in place, you're not supposed to get money from the federal government. Uh, it was not, frankly, taken very seriously the first time around. Uh, because when hundreds of applications came into the National Institute of Justice, they were just tracking the language and saying, we certify we have such an independent entity. Uh, and indeed, they didn't. Uh, the Glenn Fine, the uh, current Inspector General in the Justice Department, did an analysis of that and found that uh, uh, many of these, uh, um, uh, that NIJ did not enforce the external um, investigation certification requirement imposed by the <laughs> Justice for All Act. Uh, that uh, uh, 74 out of the 226 applicants had submitted no certification, they just tracked the language, et cetera, um, and then NIJ said, well, send in new ones. So now across the country, uh, essentially what is happening is that entities are being set up to do just what Jim Woolley did in the Sirwak case, uh, that kind of an audit. So that's going to be the law, and that's a big improvement. It's also going to create lots of cases, uh, I submit, to some degree like this one, where either he's using intentionally false uh, scientific evidence or objectively false evidence, and the courts are going to have to deal with how do you weigh that? What kind of uh, material is this when we're deciding whether a conviction be vacated? Uh, I submit to you, in at least the case that we uh, brought to you today, uh, we don't know how long it'll take uh, uh, that uh, this one is an easy one, uh, because this false testimony uh, by the state agent uh, that uh, a reasonable inference one can consider it perjury, um, even if you use a reasonable probability, a re reasonable possibility of a different outcome, uh, it certainly was material to the trial because it undercut the credibility of the key witness in the case and uh, corroborated what had always been the defense theory uh, that just as Jay Smith told the, the fellow in jail when he was originally arrested, he did it, he did it alone, and the blood on the pants uh, came from the victim, and he probably got rid of the bloody shirt. Uh, so that's my presentation. Uh, it's very unusual to come to an academic conference with a case, but why not? <laughs> um, but we really were interested in that other, uh, uh, more arcane doctrinal issue um, that you've been discussing today. And with that, I think we have about 15 minutes uh, uh, for questions about anything. And uh, in terms of this case, uh, Colin can, can answer more better than I can. Uh, I have a question right about this case because I read the story in the plane dealer Oh, thank today. you, Peter. And uh, so either somebody made a mistake or there's something that's unclear. Because it says in the audit of Sarawak's work completed in 2005, James Woolley, and I guess he's here and could verify this or not, in a forensics expert, Spalding concluded that Sarawak's testimony at Siller's trial was not, not misleading. misleading. Yes. Let me, let me uh, uh, of course, uh, Jim's here, I can comment on that, but uh, that is accurate uh, uh, in the sense that uh, what the audit did is, uh, the, I guess it was five specific kinds of questions that were asked in reviewing the documents. So at the time that the audit was done, uh, and it's really quite prescient when you read uh, Mr. Spaulding's and Mr. Willie's summary, they say, look, he's testifying about the blood on the pants, okay? There's no documentation that he did tests on the blood on the pants. Um, so from this record, it could be the worst case scenario is that he didn't do them and he said he did. Or it could be that he did the tests and he didn't document it. It's impossible to know. But on the record as it stood then, that's not misleading to the jury in the sense that a lot of that came out in the cross-examination of Sirwick. What was not known <laughs> when they did the audit, and the audit was put together in this fashion, it was to identify problematic cases where his science would be profitably pursued. But there was not any, uh, it was specifically understood that uh, the auditors were not required, nor were they funded, to go ahead and do DNA testing in any particular case or to do additional scientific tests to see what the real story was. So uh, in fact, our, our position is, and we, this is how we uh, brief the matter, uh, is that now that you have the DNA test results, the answer to the question that the audit identified was, you know, did he do the test, didn't he do the tests? Well, he probably didn't do them, in my judgment, because if you did them, you would have identified all these blood stains. But even if he did them, and he didn't record it, 
they would have come out positive for blood, so then he's suppressing exculpatory material purposely. So either way, it's false testimony. So that clarifies it. But you did remind me of something else that I should have discussed. Um, and that is uh, one other thing that I'm sort of in a pretty good position to talk about. Because uh, I think, Peter, you had a slide earlier of the exoneration that we've had a, just a run of them. 12 out of Dallas alone, uh, one city. Um, and then there was one in upstate New York. In these cases, you know, I just start telling the Michael Green case, well, Connie Schultz writes an article, the real perpetrator comes forward. You know, like this is everyday stuff, you know. <laughs> um, here's one in upstate New York um, where uh, there, uh, Roy Brown, Roy Brown got himself out of jail. Uh, he does open records act requests for information in this case where he was convicted of a murder and arson was involved. And he gets these uh, police reports that indicates that there's an individual, Barry Bench, who had a motive for killing uh, um, the person whom Brown is convicted of killing. And Brown, being a very religious man and is seeking pro se DNA tests, writes a letter to Bench and says, I see now that you're the person who really committed this crime, and I fear God, and you ought to fear God too, because when these DNA tests are going to come out, it's going to be clear that you committed this crime. Um, and there was actually bite mark evidence offered against Brown. They looked at these bite marks, and a local dentist came forward and said, aha, uh, these bite marks are consistent with Brown, and that's key forensic evidence to convict him. Uh, Mr. Bench gets these letters from Brown and throws himself in front of a train, I think, I believe, kills himself. Um, then, uh, eventually, uh, the Innocence Project is able to take over representation of Brown, who has, you know, figured this all out by himself. Um, and uh, we were able to do DNA testing uh, on the, uh, the bite mark areas. The DNA comes back to exclude Brown. Okay, therefore the bite mark obviously is unreliable. And uh, actually first we do some, we get a Bench's daughter to give us a sample and we're able to figure out through paternity testing that it's gonna be Bench's DNA and eventually they exhume his body and confirm that it really is from Bench so he plainly committed the crime and the conviction was vacated just last week. But the interesting detail is that the chief forensic dentist, uh, people well known to our friends in forensic circles, Lowell Levine, uh, in New York State, considered one of the leading bite mark experts, if, um, although that is a very questionable discipline, if you must know. Uh, but Lowell took a look at the bite marks in this case. He was asked by the prosecutor in upstate New York to look at it. He looks at it and he says, well, I see one bite mark here, right? But in my judgment, that's an exclusion. It's not Brown. And so the prosecutor literally says to him, well, don't write that down in the mistaken belief that if it's not written, he doesn't have to disclose it in discovery. <laughs> Sounds like what you were talking about all morning, right? Uh, and uh, in fact, then he goes out and he gets a local dentist who testifies that they're a match. Now, I, I think if you've been following the Duke case, you've seen that uh, the State Bar in North Carolina has taken some unusual steps here against the prosecutor, Michael Nifong. They have brought ethics charges against him for various comments that he made about uh, the young men that were charged in that case, where uh, Nifon called them hooligans. Uh, he said, why, why uh, if they're so innocent, why are they hiring lawyers, right? <laughs> Not exactly, a, and these are bar charges against him. And then finally, as it turns out, uh, there was a second round of DNA testing done on oral anal uh, um, swabs and underwear from the victim in this case, or the accuser, I probably should say. And uh, the, uh, they got DNA results through Y DNA testing that identifies the Y chromosome. It doesn't mean that there's necessarily any semen here. In fact, tests indicate that there's no semen there. Um, but they got four different male profiles, none of whom matched the three defendants. And Nai Fang, uh, it's clear from a hearing, asked the uh, DNA analyst not to put that in the report, not to reveal it. Um, uh, and the judge actually wanted to know it. And by law, supposedly, uh, on North Carolina, it is alleged in this new bar complaint that should have been disclosed. So Nai Fang is being brought up on charges there. Uh, but if you compare what this prosecutor in upstate New York did to what Nai Fang is alleged to have done, I mean, nobody has yet been convicted in the Duke case. And it may very well be that when the Attorney General looks at this case, he will decide not to uh, uh, bring it forward. I suspect that is going to be the case. 
Uh, but why isn't there some uh, action taken against this prosecutor in New York State? Uh, when Peter Neufeld, Jim Dwyer, and I wrote this book, Actual Innocence, where we try to go through all the causes of wrongful convictions, um, and we had a chapter on bad lawyering, and we had a chapter on uh, uh, prosecutorial misconduct. And we were trying to think about what are the remedies for this kind of thing. And as you all know, uh, prosecutors are, have absolute immunity for any actions they undertake uh, when they're engaged in the adversarial process, and there's good reasons for that. You don't want people looking over their shoulders unnecessarily. But when they're in the, uh, and second-guessed all the time, and fear of lawsuits would be hard to prosecute. On the other hand, for actions taken in the investigative stage, when the prosecutor is no different, really, than a police officer, they only have qualified immunity. Uh, incidentally, Mike Nifong, you should know, uh, when you look at the police reports in the Duke case, uh, declared himself an investigator. He said, I am running this investigation before the charges were brought. So I would submit he, <clears throat> he only has qualified immunity. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it's very hard to sue prosecutors, and it should be. Uh, and it's rare that prosecutors are brought up on criminal charges for even uh, suppression of exculpatory evidence. So how else are we going to discipline people unless we take these bar cases very seriously? Um, and the same thing I'd want to hasten to add and emphasize uh, should be true for ineffective assistance of counsel. Um, you know, we are not going to end this problem of inadequate representation, uh, you know, for the poor in this country uh, and people of color and others unless uh, when people just do an absolutely horrible job. I'm not just talking about mistakes and I'm not just talking about you know, uh, garden variety. There's plenty of suppressed Brady material that I'm sure prosecutors in complete good faith <clears throat> just, you know, didn't think of turning over or didn't look at it the right way. But when we're talking about actions where it, you can plainly see uh, that there's some kind of malice or bad intent, how can we not bring people up on bar charges? And how can we not allow lawyers who just don't do anything to prepare a case and don't interview witnesses and don't go see the client and uh, uh, don't do anything and just show up for these trials uh, and, and let people get convicted? Because nothing guarantees the conviction of an innocent more than bad lawyers. And why wasn't Joseph Sarawak <laughs> identified earlier all these years here? Because of inadequacies in the discovery rule and maybe the defense bar wasn't doing enough to question his work. And that's true in every one of these forensic fraud type situations, whether it's you know Zane in West Virginia or in Texas or Gilchrist in Oklahoma City or Melnikoff in Montana or any of these cases. I mean, where was the defense bar? Let me be the first to say it as a former president of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. So I think the, if we don't discipline people, um, these rules will never be taken seriously, so we have to do that. So I think the Nifong thing is terrific. Uh, you know, I don't want to prejudge him. Uh, uh, why not? <laughs> I may want to sue him, but I don't want to prejudge him. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, I hope people would look into this case in New York because we see a lot of this. Uh, thank you for reminding me, Peter. <laughs> yes? that came to my mind was an uh, interesting way, like a check and balance on prosecutorial misconduct would be that if we allowed, or the law was passed to allow the public defender, the county public defender, to have grand jury authority over prosecutors, police officers, judges, and public officials. That is their jurisdiction. And the public defender's office would actually have the authority <clears throat> to indict, to go before a grand jury and indict just those four, <clears throat> those four different groups. And all of a sudden, you'd actually see the prosecutors would play a lot straighter, would be a lot more careful about what it was that they did, as would public officials, police officers, and judges. It's a very interesting check and balance. Well, that's an interesting idea as a, as a former public defender. Uh, but one thing that, uh, but I'm not altogether sure that uh, people, that, that um, you know, one gets nervous about uh, people with, you know, institutional interests uh, running grand juries. I certainly do. Um, and, you know, the, the great thing about uh, our system is prosecutors are supposed to try hot, strike hard blows but fair ones, right? Uh, and uh, are, are ministers of justice, and that is their peculiar role. And defense attorneys, you know, we're supposed to uh, uh, represent people that are guilty. 
and put the state to its proof. So I'm not sure we'd be terrific at grand juries. On the other hand, uh, there is a process, uh, for example, in Texas and other jurisdictions called courts of inquiry. And so if there's malfeasance <clears throat> or misfeasance of some serious kind, uh, for example, of all places in Texas, you can, uh, can, a judge can convene a court of inquiry uh, to look into public officers. In New York, we have special grand juries, actually, uh, that can look into uh, uh, these kinds of things. Uh, I myself uh, would favor, um, I think we did recommend this in Actual Innocence, that um, among our bar associations, that there should be special groups uh, of experienced judges, <clears throat> former prosecutors, or uh, um, and defense counsel that would sit and look at misconduct in criminal cases by both the defense and the prosecution. Because I, I have a feeling that uh, you don't want just any uh, disciplinary word of bar association, lay people too should be on it, <coughs> to be looking at these things. I mean, you want people that have an experienced eye. Because I don't think every, uh, quote, suppressed Brady material, and look, Brady material is just uh, material that uh, tends to exculpate a defendant, and it could have been suppressed by a cop, by a prosecutor, uh, and they may not have realized its significance, right? I mean, that's what we learned from the difference between Bagley and Eggers, of course, as you look at it from what the defense could have done with it, all right? But that does, that's not the same thing as a kind of malicious suppression that we see in a lot of these cases, um, which, frankly, should be criminal, but uh, I'm trying to be realistic about uh, what happens. I don't think we're going to be prosecuting lawyers so quickly. Uh, but sure, uh, we ought to, uh, as a profession, uh, take this seriously uh, in terms of misconduct. Otherwise, uh, we're just going to, and, you know, and, and, it, and what it would do, I was listening to the Ruiz discussion this morning, having to do with uh, <clears throat> disclosure, you know, in police situations. Uh, but if, if there were a, bar, a serious bar sanction, right, maybe in theory in certain guilty plea situations if you suppress, um, you know, impeachment material or plainly exculpatory evidence, uh, maybe that won't necessarily vacate a conviction. Uh, but uh, it sure should be uh, uh, whoever did it ought to be sanctioned. You know, and, and that's the key because you look at these forensic cases and there's bad science um, in lots of cases where people are guilty. I mean, that's true. That's why they get away with it, <laughs> right? Because we are not Iran. Most people that you pick up, they're supposed to be more probable than not before you indict them or, or, or bring them to trial. So most people ought to be guilty, but obviously not all of them are. That's the whole point of the system. Uh, and and uh, so, sure, these forensic people get away with it because nobody really questions them in the cases where the guilty are on trial. And it's, uh, if you take this adversary system seriously, um, even suppress Brady material in cases of guilty people um, should be subject to sanction. That's what it's all about. Okay, maybe one short question. In terms of sanctions, talking for the uh, forensic people, are any, have any of these people gone to jail? <laughs> well, none of them have gone to jail, uh, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, I think Sirowak uh, at one point was teaching in a community college or a college uh, criminalistics, and uh, uh, some articles were written about it, and I think he was let go there. Uh, so I've really lost track of him. A lot of these other people, you know, uh, uh, the lawsuits certainly have been filed. Uh, Fred Zane died. I know that. Uh, so, uh, I, but I don't. I don't know of anybody that's gone to prison. Well, thank you very much. We could go on all afternoon. We could go on all afternoon, but we actually have another session. Um, let's take a 15-minute break. We will reconvene at 2.50 on this clock. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. <clears throat>